Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure uh, to, uh, to be with you uh, today to talk about um, recovery. You know, traditionally, uh, intensivists have not um, paid a lot of attention to recovery. I'm um, an intensivist. We, we, we generally wave at the patient as they leave the ICU and think, live, live long and prosper. We've done our job. You're leaving through the front door, not the back door. That's a good thing. Um, and we don't think about what happens to the patients afterwards. But patients that have acute kidney injury uh, often have uh, very significant uh, effects on long-term recovery, and that's what I'd like to explore with you a little bit uh, today. Um, so th some of the early evidence that, um, that there was a long-term adverse effects of uh, acute kidney injury despite uh, recovery comes from uh, some work uh, shown in this paper, uh, as well as others, uh, showing that uh, even uh, in patients who appear to recover renal function and hospital discharge, there's still a significant effect on uh, both death and the development of, uh, of de novo uh, CKD. And so patients may recover renal function by hospital discharge, but still be at risk uh, for uh, long-term outcomes. Now, there may be differences amongst different um, forms of acute kidney injury, and, and some provocative data uh, uh, is, is shown here in which it appears that uh, patients that develop acute kidney injury but recover, even if they only partially recover, they seem to have a pretty good outcome in uh, sepsis-associated AKI um, compared to patients who, uh, who don't uh, recover. And this is somewhat different than what's been generated uh, in other populations. And uh, we took this a step further and looked at it in this uh, study uh, uh, from a few years ago uh, and went back and looked at uh, longer term outcomes. This is three year uh, survival uh, in patients that uh, have uh, no AKI, patients that uh, have AKI and recover and patients that don't recover. And this is a milder uh, population. The previous study was done in septic shock. This is in hospitalized community-acquired pneumonia. Only about 16% of these patients uh, went to the ICU. So it's a much lower risk population, which is why the, the curves are higher in the field. But nevertheless, um, there seems to be a, a, a pretty significant difference between patients who recover renal function and those patients that don't in terms of long-term outcome. And in fact, recovery in this, uh, uh, like in the previous study, is not statistically different from having no AKI at all. So it suggests that even going out to as, more, as far as three years, there seems to be a pretty good outcome. Now, it's possible that uh, there's still adverse effects of kidney injury that are not manifest in short term or even up to three year survival. So if you imagine uh, that a patient has uh, developed acute kidney injury uh, and appears to have uh, recovery, some of those patients could in fact have only apparent recovery and still have lost a functional renal reserve and still may have normal resting GFRs. But if you did a provocative test, if you did a renal stress test, for example, you would demonstrate that they had lost nephrons. And these patients still may be at risk for developing uh, cardiovascular outcomes and for developing clinical chronic kidney disease. It may take many years for that risk to be fully manifest. And so it may not be demonstrable in terms of a change in mortality over the short term, even going out as far as a few years. Now, that's the long-term outcomes, but it turns out that we really don't know anything about how these patients recover even in the short term. And this was, um, so the motivation for this uh, analysis was that we needed to try to understand how patients progress through their clinical course through their journey, as, as people are fond of, of talking about uh, these days, um, from developing acute kidney injury to hopefully leaving the hospital intact and having uh, good long-term outcomes. And so what happens to these people and how do they recover? And because this has direct impact on how we care for patients in the hospital. And so what we did is an analysis is based on this conceptual model where we looked at uh, patients having acute kidney injury 
uh, and looking at whether or not they reverse their kidney injury in the first seven days of their uh, AKI, and then finally looking at hospital discharge as a, as a, uh, a marker of whether they had uh, essentially had recovery of their renal dysfunction uh, or not. And so we started with a cohort of 45,000 patients, uh, and we looked at the proportion of these patients that had stage 2 or 3 AKI. Why did we look at stage 2, 3 AKI instead of all AKI? Well, for one thing, it's not entirely clear that stage 1 AKI is independently associated with outcomes. Some studies suggest that it is. Some studies suggest that it's not. But more importantly, if we're going to look at recovery from acute kidney injury, it becomes very... Um, challenging if you look at uh, just stage 1 AKI because very small changes in renal function can bring you above or below the threshold. If you look at stage 2, 3 AKI and you require them to get all the way back down below stage 1, then there's really no ambiguity about whether they've recovered renal function or not. So from a pragmatic standpoint, we just focused on stage 2 or 3 AKI. And what we found was that two-thirds of patients recovered uh, or reverse their renal dysfunction rapidly within the first seven days. And in fact, the majority of those reverse within 48 to 72 hours. So the typical scenario, if you will, even in stage 2, 3 AKI, two-thirds of these patients will get better in the first 48 hours, 72 hours, at least one week. However, that doesn't mean they're out of the woods. Commonly, in fact, more patients had a relapse whether or not it was a re relapse with ultimate recovery or a relapse with no recovery, then had a sustained reversal. So they got better, but then they slid back into renal dysfunction. Sometimes getting better and having complete recovery by hospital discharge, other times not having recovery uh, at all. And this had profound implications for both short-term and long-term outcomes. If you look just at the long uh, one-year outcomes, which are shown at the bottom here, you can see that patients that have a relapse but no recovery have a 60% um, hospital or have a 60% one-year mortality, which is almost identical to patients that had uh, no uh, reversal uh, at all. And you can see that the length of stay uh, uh, is quite significantly different for patients that had uh, um, a, a non-recovery event uh, versus a recovery event. Uh, this is the Kaplan-Meier curves, and you can see again, this is relapse, no recovery, this is never reversed. Uh, these are the uh, 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 patterns of uh, late sustained reversal uh, or uh, relapse with recovery versus early sustained reversal. This is a little complicated, uh, but it's meant to show you um, the, the sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive value of a uh, of a episode of resolution or parent resolution of AKI relative to predicting whether they'll leave the hospital with normal kidney function. This is important if you're a nephrologist and you're seeing a patient in consult. Do you sign off the patient? when they're re sustained reversal for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours? When can you be relatively confident that the patient is going to actually make a full recovery? It turns out that you still don't have that high a positive predictive value. It's still only 86% after 96 hours of recovery. And clearly, if you look below, before 48 hours, uh, you only have an 80% positive predictive value, meaning that you're only 80% likely to be fully recovered at hospital discharge if, you re if your apparent reversal is uh, uh, occurring for 48 hours or less. So clearly, um, a persistent, uh, or I should say a sustained reversal of AKI is clearly something that can only be defined by uh, reversal, which is, which is sustained for at least 72 hours. Um, what predicts non-recovery in patients? So I have a patient who has AKI. What can predict non-recovery for these patients? Which are the patients that are going to have a, uh, a non-recovery uh, uh, scenario? Uh, and it turns out that the usual uh, variables are in play here. As you're older, 
Um, that was clearly an adverse event. Males tend to recover better than females. Why is that? It may, it may be a fluke. It may have something to do with creatinine kinetics in, in patients that have more uh, muscle mass to lose. Okay, so the problem is, is that if you come in and you've got a lot of muscle mass and you have a, a creatinine and you've really just lost a lot of muscle mass and so the creatinine seems to get back down to, to where it started, that might not be recovery. And so further st uh, studies need to uh, actually understand whether real GFR is recovered, not just uh, creatinine. Uh, so there are, uh, and then there's some interesting things, suspected sepsis is associated with a increased uh, rate, uh, if you will, of, uh, of recovery, a decreased risk of non-recovery. Again, sepsis is a better prognosis if you recover, and sepsis also appears to be a positive predictor of having recovery. The problem is it also is a predictor of relapse. So your patients that have sepsis are at the highest risk for having a relapse in their AKI after apparent recovery. So if they have final recovery at the end of their hospitalization, they, they do the best, but they're at the highest risk for uh, a relapse uh, in the first few days. Now, what does this have to do with the underlying biology of acute kidney injury? We actually have no idea because we know very little about the underlying biology of renal recovery. Um, we know from animal models uh, like this sequel ligation uh, model that um, the stress uh, signal, which we can demonstrate by uh, TIMP2 and IGFBP7 staining in the tissue, um, uh, can be very short and yet the damage that occurs in these, patients, in these animals and the ultimate manifestations in terms of uh, fibrosis can be long lasting. And so this is a, a model in which uh, we do sequel ligation and puncture and you can see that the creatinines all return to pretty much normal by 24 hours and completely normal within 14 days. Uh, NGAL signal is completely gone in 24 hours. So there's no more damage, if you will, but they still develop fibrosis. And so one of the concerns that we have about patients with sepsis is that their AKI, their function, may return to normal. They may have this apparent relapse, or this apparent recovery, apparent reversal, but that the ultimate kidney function is more a function of what happens to them vis-a-vis -vis, um, fibrosis. So it may well turn out that this apparent reversal in terms of the dysfunction, is belying an underlying progressive uh, disease, which ultimately will produce chronic kidney disease. And that's obviously quite concerning. Now, we, f we focused a little bit on this in, uh, in the ADKEY meeting a few years ago, where we defined acute kidney disease as kidney injury that persists uh, for more than seven days. Uh, and so you stop calling it a KKI after a certain time, but you can't call it chronic kidney disease until three months. So acute kidney disease is sort of that persistent acute kidney injury, if you will. Uh, and patients, different patients have different trajectories. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and these trajectories are borne out in the study that I showed you a moment ago. And we have some recommendations. So just to highlight a couple of those, uh, persistent acute kidney injury is characterized by a continuance of AKI by serum creatinine or urine output as defined by KDGO for more than 48 hours. And the reason that's important is that if most patients are going to resolve their kidney dysfunction within 48 to 72 hours, those that don't have a terrible prognosis and therefore you should be extra careful in assessing those patients. In other words, you should be asking yourself, what am I missing here? This patient should be getting better, and they're not. What is it that I might be able to do differently uh, if I'm going to ask for help in sub subspecialty consultation, for example? This is when I'm going to involve uh, uh, additional uh, uh, resources. Another recommendation is the initial management a persistent AKI would include reassessment of the underlying etiology, AKI uh, uh, measurements of kidney function. Uh, if there's evidence of persistent AKI, additional uh, evaluation uh, should be uh, should be done. This may be when it's appropriate to biopsy a patient. You know, we don't biopsy patients with AKI, and yet we're missing some. Uh, amount of underlying uh, uh, renal disease in these patients, and this may be the population that we would consider. Um, 
The other piece of information is that if we pay strict attention to this issue, I think we can improve outcomes. So this is just a little study we did, a uh, little study. We did a study on 500,000 patients in Western Pennsylvania. Um, this is a more like an Andy Shaw study. Uh, this is a, a, it was a QI project. We did a, a study where we implemented, we did a project where we implemented a electronic surveillance uh, cl clinical decision support uh, tool. And all this did, the, the, the secret sauce in this, in this clinical decision support was to go back and find the reference creatinines for clinicians. Because what happens is a patient has a creatinine and it's 1.1 milligrams per deciliter and their baseline is 0.6 and nobody can find that in the chart. And what this does is goes back into the medical record all the prior records and finds the baseline creatinines, does a little bit of analytics to figure out what the baseline should be, and then serves that up to the clinician so the clinician can say, oh, okay, this is a significant departure from the baseline creatinine. And then it monitors the creatinine every day. So if there's a 48-hour window that the 0.3 change in serum creatinine occurs, then the clinician is alerted. Even if the patient's on the orthopedic service, there's a flag that goes off. And as a result, so this is the flag, as a result, um, there was actually a, a significant decrease in the mortality rate of patients who had acute kidney injury from 10.2% uh, down to 9.4%, whereas there was no difference in patients that didn't have acute kidney injury. This also demonstrates the significant delta, even in patients outside the ICU, between those that have AKI and those that don't have AKI in terms of their mortality. The other thing is we cut dialysis rates from 6.7% in this population down to 4%, uh, and that's uh, statistically significant as well. So in conclusion, recovery following acute kidney injury may proceed differently in different patients after different forms of injury. About 60% of patients with moderate to severe AKI recover by hospital discharge with dramatic effect on long-term survival. One-year mortality is threefold higher if they have no recovery. About 25% of patients with er have early sustained reversal of AKI by creatinine, while another 25% have no reversal at all. The remaining have this fluctuating course, which has never been described before in the literature, this relapsing course uh, of AKI, which might have underlying clinical correlates in the basic biology of AKI. The cell cellular molecular picture is different, uh, and these, of these different phenotypes is completely unknown. And with that, I thank you uh, for your attention. <laughs>